And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne come to the reality of the divinity of his majesty is a personal, a very personal manifestation. You still have to go into your own meditation, your own reasoning with someone and come to you the full reality of the divinity of his majesty. Since the scriptures tell us that there are three major representations of God in time, this is the millennium that we are in now. And this is the last time that we are seeing a manifestation of God before the fulfillment of the prophecy. We have Adam, we have Jesus Christus, and we have his imperial majesty. On the 2nd of November, 1930, Rastafari is crowned the 225th emperor of Ethiopia. Hail Selassie I re-establishing the Solomonic dynasty. He is crowned King of Kings, conquering line of the tribe of Judah, elect of God. The ascendancy of Hail Selassie to the throne of Ethiopia marked the arrival of a day of redemption for black people and the Rastafari movement was born. Queen Manon was also crowned Empress, establishing the principle of King Alpha and Queen Amiga the beginning and the end eternally consummated. I think it's the first time you have a king and a queen crowned together, you know. You have kings crowned, like the typical monarchies will have a king, and then his wife is his wife, you know. We have a coronation where we have a king and a queen, that's why I say Rasta man, have a special duty, you know. You, you cannot conceive of yourself as one without the other, a man. No man can be so bright as to tell me that he's a man and he don't even have any responsibility or relationship with a daughter somewhere, you know? It, that is when you come in your fullness. We would think of his imperial majesty as the highest divine order. So Queen Mary would have to be the mother of creation and she would therefore have to be the beginning of how we behave. She could be a light. For the woman. Empress Menon traces her lineage back to the Queen Sheba, the Queen of Ethiopia, who journeyed to King Solomon, the keeper of the divine laws, the Ark of the Covenant. On her return to Ethiopia, she gave birth to Solomon's son, Menelik, who as a young man returned to Solomon's kingdom to claim the Ark of the Covenant. This was then established in Ethiopia at Aksum. Out of this tradition evolved the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church is the first Christian manifestation coming out of Egypt. It's the first Christian acceptance of God and a man coming from God at this point in time. And uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church teaches that man is black and that Jesus Christus is black. <laughs> Ethiopia is the whole of Africa. And Ethiop, that the, the Bible would refer to, is a black man. At that time, regarded as a Kushite, you know, from the land of Kush. And the Ethiopian have a special place in his majesty's book you know in that uh, we are the promised people and uh, even though he tell us many of those that are the promised people will come one day after he choose the ones that he wants we still have to go down into the valley of jehoshaphat for another weeding out you know so we know that our road is a, a long and troublesome trial but is 
a trot, there is a victory at, at, at in sight. <laughs> put on her dread is with deep thought. A woman don't just dread. She don't just stop comb her hair. If you get up one day when you're 23 years old and say to yourself, well, I'm going dread. That is a threat to society. It is a threat whether you are a working class woman or a middle class woman. And unfortunately, still in the Caribbean here, we have to talk about class distinctions because they exist. It's a reality. Whether you be working class, middle class, upper class, whatever you want to call it. If a woman put on a dread, it means it is in defiance of what has been already ordained as beautiful, clean, upright. Um, and it means that she has gone into this Rasta thing seriously. We represent the kingdom of God. You know, we are a part, we are children of the Most High and we are a part of his kingdom, and this is what we do represent. Just as what the man represents, we represent a part of God's kingdom, just in a feminine structure. a very spiritual person. I've right? always been going to a lot of churches <laughs> from my very small, you know. And then I started to do a course at the School of Dance, which is a diploma course. And um, I remember them taking us out into the field, you know. We went to different, as they call it, subcultures. <laughs> Eventually now they took us to some bingy brethren. I remember when I went home now, afterwards I said, well, I wondered, you know, I said, how come the society is fighting these people? And, and yet everything the brethren were saying was true. You understand? And then after that, I started to look in and, you know, look and keep reading and stuff. And then I met my children's father, and he invited me to a meeting. And from the first day I stepped in, I realized that, yes, this is really where I'm supposed to be. That was about the late 78, early 79. But all I know is that it seems like, it seems to me now that a lot of people then, a lot of young people then, were starting to fight, you know, about that time. Like many Rastafarians my generation, I wasn't born in a Rastafarian family. I was born in a Christian family. And we spent quite a bit of time in the church because my father is a preacher. Um, I got basically my religious training from there. And when I was going to school, to high school, and I was living with my parents, I used to go to church and do all the things that a nice little girl is supposed to do. And I found that after I started going to university, I started questioning, questioning a number of things within the Christian church. And there was a period that I stopped going to church completely. After a number of years, one starts looking, you know, seeking that path that is going to provide the peace of mind and the contentment and the self-confidence that one needs really to go through life. And I found I gravitated more towards the Rastafarian, so I spent quite a bit of time around them, just sitting and listening and reasoning with them. And I was already familiar with the Bible, you know, but I started dealing with it on a different level. And then the natural progression took place. Coming into Rastafari was 
I would call it a terrible experience, you know. Because after getting certain fights from parents, you know, parents was the first. Parents was the first fight I get, right? And you know, society in our world, especially growing up with parents who is well be known, <laughs> right? That the people in our world check for, you know what I mean? So, in that way, you know, I fight really get at and at because everywhere I go, you can hear that is Mr. Sweeney's daughter and taking self and turn to Rasta and many things, you know. When I just started trotting within the Rastafari faith, I was a little bit rash in terms of hitting out at the system and so on. Um, and I did create some problems for myself because of my rashness and tactlessness and all of that. And I think there was a period where I was a little bit irresponsible, you know, in that um, I didn't take work as seriously as I ought to have taken it. So you find that I was absent from work a couple of days for no reason and so on. But then after I started having children, I developed a more responsible attitude to what I was doing, and I saw that, well, there are some of the things that I was doing that I really had to question, too, even as a young Rastafari. My parents had a, a concept, and I think, you know, their kind of experience kind of made them come to that decision, you know, that Rasta was just what left, you know, because they'd, they'd seen Rasta man, they'd said, you know, who did nothing more than beg. And I think they were more, they were very afraid for me, you know, and that was difficult for me as well because I didn't really, I didn't want to hurt my parents in any way at all, you know. And, um, you know, to explain to them, you know, why I was changing, I didn't do that either because I didn't know how to. My cousin came down from Gloucester and he just got into Rastafari. He was 16, I was about 12 then, and he, showed me little bits and pieces. So when I was about 14, I started to hear a bit more about Rasta. By the time I was 15, you know, I wanted to get into it. I said, definitely. But because I was at home, you know, I wouldn't lock out of respect to my mum. When I was 16, I left home and locked up. I was there at that time living around Ladbroke Grove and Brixton and that was where you really saw the first Rasta men and later on a couple of Rasta women, you know, and um, but it's funny enough it wasn't in England that I really see the philosophy or the lifestyle. It was really going out of England and coming forward and straightening it. You know? It was love that drew me to them. I know a dreadlocks, the elderly man by the name of Gunn, and just the way how he lives, you know, it really um, pulled me towards it, and I think it was right. I give thanks and praises to the Most High that he caught me at a young age. I was born in the ghetto and I grew up like any youth now you could know in the ghetto. So those experiences teach me knowledge. As a young woman, as Rastafari, it was very tough in that time because for me, living up in this area, in the Kingston Six, there was no young woman who, you know, <laughs> say Rastafari. It was a big woman like my, my sister in there. But you never find youth in woman. They used to think I was mad, you know, or a lot of funny things about me. And therefore, I did not keep friends. It's only like the brethren, them, you know, I would have as my friend. But 
He never have any sisters around that time. It's only like Rita Marley and she was in town. So I would have to leave from here and go there and check her, you know. But it was very hard because it was few of us. When I first came back, it was after about 14 years living away. So it was um, a whole heap of changes, you know. And also what made it especially so was because I'd never come back to Jamaica as a Rasta and I didn't realize the whole vibration against Rastafari out here, you know. Mm -hmm. Thinking that this was the home of Rasta, I didn't realize that there was going to be so many problems being a Rasta. So it was a shock. <laughs> I went into this yard where Rastas live and rent a room there. It was interesting staying there because here comes Bingy Planner and Brother Marx teaching American language every Wednesday evening. Well, my sister and I and dear father used to attend classes. They knock how interested in this African language because my dear father would have a photo of his majesty at home. He always talk about this great king and so on. So. And then we started to learn a little about the language and then listening now to Bingy Plana and Brother Marx and the rest of Rasta talk about Africa and this King of Kings and Rasta. It, I mean, it's like I became convinced and converted, you know. So by 69, I was able to start shut up in this faith. At the time here, it was Marcus Garvey, Malcolm Hicks, and... Um, Walter Rodney, he was in Jamaica at the time, and he really started to youth them, you know, because it was like violence that we were learning about Africa, and if we want to return to Africa, we'd have to kill off everybody, you know. But when Dr. Walter Rodney came down here in the 60s, he told us we must educate ourselves, we must have trade, and he, he opened more doors to us to see Africa on a higher level. Many days, and my grandfather used to say, But why are you going into this thing? What are you finding it? What? I said, But you are the root of it. You started it. Remember, you're, you're a Marcus guy, remember? You know? he, he felt insulted. But then, by really listening to him and my father, I, I really, I mean, gained something from what, because still, both of them is saying something about Africa, and what each of them is saying is something of high significance concerning Africa. It, it really link a one up within certain realms to become a Rasta, you know, and being a Rasta is a prophetical word. The woman in the Rasta movement of the 30s, the early 30s, early 40s, you hardly saw her. When I was very young, you could never see a Rasta woman out on the street in Lux, that you never saw that. So you never even thought to yourself that there was in fact a Rasta woman, that kind of thought, don't go through it, it's just Rasta man and these horrible things that you see in front of everybody, afraid and screaming. A product of, of course, the 50s up, uprising and um, the fact that, you know, government said if you see one, kill the other one. So the Rasta woman has gone through, I think, from that time, a process of really just coming forward, just coming forward.
in the the front of the wall. We suffer a lot down there with the Babylonians and them, like the police and the soldiers, them and the Mr. Blind Argo, all of them, man, that don't question, man. Come down all the house, man. And fight us all and come down from we down a shanty town. We go and be in a football ground. And we don't live nowhere, we don't have anything, and we don't have no food, and them treat us bad in here. Them suffer, them don't have no clothes, them don't have no food, and them don't live no convenience. We're like bathroom and toilet, just like how you see here, just like a shanty stay here, like how you see here. So we live because the government never provide anything for our Rasta. Government said them don't business with me. Anyway, it's a two or three Rasta, put them in the police station, and them treat us bad, and them fight us hard. Them kill some of us, you know, kill some of the Rasta man, them and fight down our daughters and trim off all the wool and all those things, especially when you hear the politician time coming on. And you don't go vote for them, them fight us very hard, man. Them don't help us, they say we are not in their budget and them don't respond to us, it's only ja, almighty Jair Selassie respond to I and I. So we just stick in with faith and keep ourselves to ourselves. You understand me? But we got you a whole heap of tribulation, man. It's the same fight Marcus Garvey would have, you know? We're black. He try and show black people, say, you're black and you're African and what it means to you right inside of your heart, not just the color of your skin or maybe the clothes you have on. So I feel say, the society will give the woman, I really feel society give the woman a harder fight, a harder fight than the man. Those days, I say, boys, it's just like a horrible tempest because everywhere go, some people want to lift up the clothes to see if we're wearing underwear and people check you could walk in the street, but sometimes we have to walk because we can't be able to spare. Black woman, black woman, like a youth brother's law. Your trouble is that rough and rude, and what the heck is wrong? To be someone who belongs, keep bearing your mind and the hand for long. Don't give up now, pray for strength now. You want to dedicate my Of course, the whole Rasta movement is a, is a story of struggle and fight. Just, just outright fighting against the odds. There is, there is nothing laid back about the movement from the 30s through the 50s through the 60s. It's just a constant battle for just for existing. The 1930s is what is regarded as the, the beginnings of Rastafari. In Jamaica, this is not really correct, you know, but you know that Rastafari manifestation must have been here before that time. Uh, it couldn't just, what I think happened in the 30s is that it just really sprang up to the fore, that it uh, become articulated. But as we're saying now, in the 30s, you have to put Rastafari woman in the perspective of Jamaica, uh, whole of Jamaica runnings, right? And Jamaica at that time, if you remember, 1938 is the time of the uprisings. Now, there is a number of, of names that people forget of women that fight strongly on behalf of the workers. You have people like um, Adina Earl, Una Marson, these people that either take to the books and write articles for the Gleaner, like Una Marston, or people like Earl who would fight and start a labor union, actually start a labor union. Amy Jakes Garvey, for example, she founded the UNIA here in, in Jamaica in 1914-15, as far back as then. So there are women 
who were in the forefront of the black redemption battle, so to speak. In 1938, when the brothers were fighting on the waterfront and uh, the union strike, there were daughters there, you know, and those daughters were supportive of the man's struggle. Because it, it affected them as well. They'd feed them and make sure that things go on at home as usual. Now, what I'm really trying to say is that the Rasta woman is no different in this situation. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of King David, has prevailed. On the 21st of April, 1966, Emperor Hale Selassie visited Jamaica. The Rastafari elders who had recognized the significance of the Emperor's crowning were now able to confirm their beliefs. Dwellings by the city Congress give thanks I and I wake up before the young man at 4 o'clock. And we gather together and we take away transportation and we reach right at the airport. Well, His Majesty was to appear at 1 o'clock. So before him appear, I and I gather with the highly man and we never know a bingy drum man and chanting and yelling for a eye until His Majesty come. What the government at that time did was to remove all policemen from the crowd. They took them out of the crowd and removed them altogether and everyone stayed exactly where they were. When the plane come down, when his majesty come to the steps, nobody never run up and down like them mad. Everybody just in on, you know, overwhelmed at what was happening. So everything was orderly and, it, you know, so I say his majesty's visit was very important for the movement because it gave the movement the strength, the strength that it needed, the little, push that it needed to see that what Rasta was talking about all this while was really true. Well, for me, it wasn't an historical arrival. It was more a spiritual one, so I would talk for myself. It was when I saw His Majesty in 1966 when he came to Jamaica. I, before, I had no knowledge of him as God our king. So when he came to Jamaica, I saw him eye to eye, and some mystical thing happened between her and him, and for, it just came out of me that his imperial majesty is God, and my love, both of us love, you know, hope right there, it was that kind of a vibration. A lot of leaders of the Rastafari movement at that time were able to meet him personally and speak with him. And uh, it is this that we have in our history, you know, that we can know that what we believe in is really true and really correct. <laughs> I danced with his majesty when he came to Jamaica, right? And <clears throat> because of that, I feel that it is necessary for me to dance as a Rasta woman. The migration of Caribbean people to Britain and the emergence of black communities, Rastafarian ideas soon became a part of the culture that began to develop. Young black people adopted the symbols and ideas of Rastafari as a part of a process of self-expression and pride in the midst of an alien society. By the 1970s, young black women had visibly become a part of the movement we're in locks and chanting Rastafari militantly. <laughs> Re 
reggae music was to become an important means of popularizing the Rastafari doctrine. The players of instruments and singers like Judy Mowat became for many a source of information and inspiration. To you I dedicate my song To, 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 yeah work is for man and woman and because I was given the gift of communicating through music I couldn't keep silent <laughs> The first song I did was, um, I had wrote this song, Why Treat Us Than Human? Just Because We Are Woman. We are not weak, we are strong. We have been held back for much too long from portraying our womanality. Mothers of creation, there ain't no equalization, but we have got God's given talent, just like you, so open the door and see us through. Some brothers did like it and some didn't like it but that was like a voice for the sisters at that time and I was able to go through with the support of my king man because he saw what I was doing and he supported me immensely and I was able to it was not easy because I was confronted at all time that women must not do this and women must not do that but you have to know what you are sent to do and you have to take a positive stance. There's daughters out there doing things, you know. There's daughters out there because they've seen the need to progress. And even greater still, they've seen the importance of having children means to, you know, to provide a future, to provide security. You know, they've gotten up and they've decided to do something with their lives. I wouldn't say community, I would say international magazine because our market, you know, it goes internationally. That we set up to promote the, the um, image of Rastafari then through this magazine, you know, and also there's the women's theatre group, which we run, theatre, drama, poetry, DJing, you know, we um, set that up now to fulfil our ambitions as Rasta women, because, you know, all of we that's in the group, we love music, we love drama in some kind of way, and we want to put out a message, and we do that best through these things. The third thing now is the didactic school of Wadada. Okay, the school didactic school of Wadada is a supplementary school and we cater for children between the ages of 5 to 12 years. What are the aims and objectives of the school? One is that we aim to 
supplement education that's taking place in state-run schools, like the English and the Math, and also to give to our children their own history and culture to add to their well, to secure them or make them feel more secure. Right, and to do that, um, are there any special features of the program of the school? Yes, like I said, we do um, history and culture, black history and culture. We also do drama, you know, and singing. The youth can take part in singing, drumming, chanting, reading. Okay, um, Sister Benji, what part do you play? My group that I look after is from 9 to 12 year old and we also would like to do more with the children uh, say for example take them away for weekends camping and things like that nature trail and also video so we will be whole range of things to come yeah. okay the whole range of projects there I've always seen a different, different way of educating children. And for years I did try to organize something for Rasta youth or any other youth who would be interested. But um, again, finances got in the way and it just never ever came together. Finally, last year, I eventually capitulated and sent them to a government school. And um, after a certain amount of problems, because they're not willingly taking in Rasta children into the school. I always wanted to go to college from when I was 16. I haven't got any qualifications, so it's hard for me. So I've built up a portfolio of artwork and used it to get into London College of Fashion. I used to draw my um, models with Lux, because in my other college, it, it was a bit freer. My teacher was different. You know, she used to say, you know, you might as well draw your models black if you're black, but it doesn't always work that way. A few people have said to me, oh, you're a rusty, you shouldn't do fashion design, it's vanity, but, you know, you have to explain to them that all is vanity anyway, and everything around them, everything material has been designed. There are certain parts of Rastafari that I've um, adapted to suit myself. I, I don't cover my locks all the time. You know, I wear trousers sometimes, but, you know, it's not what you wear outside. Maybe it's not even the locks. It's just what's in your heart, what's inside of you. There was no law that said that you should dress this way or you shouldn't dress this way. And as a woman, and after reading my Bible, and a woman of Africa. I know how to dress. I know what to wear. Whatever I wear must be um, representing me as the African woman. You know, I must be able to identify with whatever I wear. One of the things with Rasta woman, she used to stay home, you know, like in the 60s, even in the 70s, she just used to stay home and look after children and the man would go out and so. But the family, the family business have been broken down a little. She comes out because the economic problem, she have to come out and work.
I work to fulfill my ambition and my aspiration, you know, and because, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not a woman to stay at home and mind children. I love my children. And, you know, if it was necessary, I would certainly do that. But because I believe so much in progression, progression for the Rasta, for our people, you know, because we need a lot and we have a long, long way to go. And the man them cannot do it on their own, no matter what they might think. They cannot do it alone, you know, because even the emperor quoted in one of his speech, you know, what's the use of us educating the, the girls if all they're going to do is get married and tend house? Shouldn't they just go and get married and tend house instead of being educated? Because then all that education is wasted and they cannot contribute anything to their community. which is called the Bob Marley Museum reprint series which I edit and which really features articles which have been written around Bob and uh, around Marcus Garvey and around His Imperial Majesty and uh, what we do is re reproduce these in a reprint series which we hope to make really international and worldwide and it's a very important feature of the museum because we want to keep the literate history alive as well as the oral tradition. People have preconceived ideas of what Rastafarians are without really knowing or having interacted with any of them. Let's focus a bit on this one. Can you all read together what it says over here, please? Quality, Quality is my business. Quality is my business. And here? <laughs> Quality. We have an artist who cannot spell so well. <laughs> all the things that you do must aim at I joined the Jamaican Bureau of Standards. Uh, many years ago, and the vacancy they had opened at that time was one for the quality control officer. But after a while, I realized that there wasn't much scope for growth in an organization like that. Um, the fact that I was a Rastafarian and the way people felt about Rastafarian, especially in government organizations. So I decided to leave the organization after four years and launch out on my own. My desire is not really for go out there because I know the treatment. Whether you have education, yes or no, right? You get discriminated, people have all quality things. So for be at peace with myself and my job, I prefer to stay within my gates, right? And I see we are in Ja through such a work Ja provide for I and I. I and I heat, live and sleep. I read through I and I work, so I and I do what I and I own. Yet I still do underrate a daughter who have to go out there and do it. You see, car probably that is the only way of achieving something. It was difficult for us, the woman, for us, the woman, to be employed within the society. We were like castaways of the society. So we had to provide self-help projects where we could earn some money for ourselves, to support ourselves and our children. So Ja created man in his own image. In the image of Ja, he created him. Male and female, he created I and I. From six to one, I know my king man until now. From I and I come together as the two sons and daughters and healing Rastafari. And from I know is one king man alone who is well married. In the sight of King Alpha and Queen Amigo, we do have to go to the past. Because when we live as man and woman, and King and Queen, in King Alpha's side, and it pleased you, we are well welcome. 
because we live forever and forever, which is Buana, King Alpha, and Queen Omega. We will marry it. The role of the wife within Rastafari law is a very positive role, you know. It is, and it's the most vital role, you know, for the survival of Rastafari itself, you know. The woman, she must know her, when she knows her true worth and her true self, you know, she's a good wife. And a good wife, you know, it don't just mean to do everything, you know, she is told as it is told because you know you ca you should never do anything you cannot justify to yourself and most of all to Ja. It is not some European fiction that people get married or, or that a man has responsibility for his children and his woman. You know what might be European about it is the extent of, of how the the person sees themselves as property of the other along the British lines in terms of the woman being totally the property of the man. They are just going back to the African tradition because in fact woman and man grow together as a natural manifestation of what God would like. The rest of woman is in a unique position right now in the 80s. She has reached a stage now where she's able to manifest all those dreams that maybe she's been having all this while. That she would like to be able to say things, that she would like to be able to build, to see our schools come to fruition. The Rasta man has been more concerned with the spiritual, making sure that we understand the scriptures and the prophecy. The Rastafari woman, she's fulfilling the fulfillment of Queen Omega because Empress Menin was a, a total person. And uh, this is how I think a lot of Rasta women would like to see themselves. Probably one of the most important understanding is that the woman really comes to see Ja through Ja manifestation, son of God, the man. Eh? Um, it's only nowadays that you will hear man and man reasoning and suggesting that maybe a daughter can come to see the fullness of Jah in our own time and through our own strength. I recognize and acknowledge the kings of... And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. To come to the reality of the divinity of his majesty is a personal, a very personal, manifestation you still have to go into your own meditation your own reasoning with someone and come to your, the full reality of the divinity of his majesty since the scriptures tell us that there are three major representations of God in time this is the millennium that we are in now and this is the last time that we are seeing a manifestation of God before the fulfillment of the prophecy. We have Adam, we have Jesus Christus, and we have his imperial majesty. On the 2nd of November, 1930, Rastafari is crowned the 225th emperor of Ethiopia, Hail Selassie I, re-establishing the Solomonic dynasty. He is crowned king of kings, conquering line of the tribe of Judah elect of God. The ascendancy of Hail Selassie to the throne of Ethiopia marked the arrival of a day of redemption for black people and the Rastafari movement was born. Queen Manon was also crowned empress, establishing the principle of King Alpha and Queen Amiga, the beginning and the end eternally consummated. I think it's the first time you have a king and a queen crowned together, you know. 
you have king's crown, like the typical monarchies will have a king, and then his wife is his wife, you know? We have a coronation where we have a king and a queen, that's why I say Rasta man, have a special duty, you know? You, you cannot conceive of yourself as one without the other, a man. No man can be so bright as to tell me that he's a man and he don't even have any responsibility or relationship with a daughter somewhere, you know? It, that is when you come in your fullness. We would think of His Imperial Majesty as the highest divine order. So, Queen Mary would have to be the mother of creation and she would therefore have to be the beginning of how we behave. She could be a light for the woman. Empress Menon traces her lineage back to the Queen Sheba, the Queen of Ethiopia who journeyed to King Solomon, the keeper of the divine laws, the Ark of the Covenant. On her return to Ethiopia, she gave birth to Solomon's son, Menelik, who as a young man returned to Solomon's kingdom to claim the Ark of the Covenant. This was then established.